Father, we thank you so much for the word. And we thank you that today we can really go into it, Lord. Father, I pray that you continue to bless our hearts and minds. Hide me behind your cross. And use me as a conduit to express your goodness. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. So you are in Luke chapter 5. And we're going to verse 7. And I'm going to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. We're going to have more so of a Bible study and interaction. Is that okay? All right, awesome. So Luke chapter 5 and verse 7. The context is that Jesus is at Peter's house. And this is what the Bible tells us. It came to pass on a certain day, as Jesus was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to do what? Heal them. Now notice, according to the passage, contextually, as we compare gospel with gospel, we realize that Jesus is at Peter's house at this moment. So as he's at Peter's house, You have the Pharisees, you have scribes, teachers of the law, doctors that are gathered there with him to hear the words of the Lord. But it's interesting, as you look at other passages concerning this same story, for example, in the book of Matthew, you realize it's not just the doctors that were there. There were multitudes of people that were gathered at that house to listen to the words of Christ. Now, where were they coming from? The Bible tells us three places. Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. So my first question for you is this. If they're coming from Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, what religious background do you think they had? Jewish, right? So we're talking here, could we say then that we're talking here about the people of God? Could we say that we're talking about the church? In this story. All right. So God's people are gathered around Jesus to hear the message that he's giving. And one of the things that we will learn as we go forth in this story is that while we can be close to Christ in proximity, we can be very far from him spiritually. And so as we continue, it says in verse 18, it says, and behold, Men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, meaning he was a paralytic, probably a quadriplegic, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before Jesus. So this guy's trying to get to Jesus, his friends are trying to bring him, but then it says there's something wrong. Now remember, who's gathered around Jesus to hear the words of Christ? The people of God, the church, right? Now notice what the Bible tells us here. In verse 19, and when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of who? So get this, the very church of God obstructed the way to God. All right. So there are times, this is one of the greatest rebukes to me as a person, as a member of the church, that I must always keep in mind that I never stand in the way of people that are trying to get to the Son of God. That I make sure that while I'm close to Christ and hearing Him, I don't stand in the way of someone trying to get to Him. Now, this is a rebuke, yes, for the church, but notice, you guys know the story. Did this guy give up because of the multitude? So that tells me something else. There may be those who are seeking to get to Jesus and the people of God stand in the way of that individual getting to God, but we must still be persistent. Regardless of what the obstruction may be, as Jesus draws, he will make a way for us to get to him. Now, why was this man trying to get to Jesus? One of the things that I was looking at was two statements In a book by the name of Welfare Ministry and also a powerful book named Desire of Ages. So we're going to look at one of them. And this is what we find out here about this man. It says, Desire of Ages, page 264, paragraph 4. The cry of the dying man was, Oh, that I might come into his presence, 
There was no time to lose. Why? Already his wasted flesh was showing signs of decay. So he was, he was decaying. He was totally rotting away. And he's trying to get to Jesus. Now remember, it's very interesting that we find that in verse 20, when the man finally gets to Jesus, we learn a few things. Jesus says to the man in verse 20, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. So that means what got the man into the predicament that he was in? Sin. So he comes to Jesus even in spite of his sin. And that's a lesson for us. Regardless of what we have done, regardless of the mistakes of our past, Christ says we can come to him as we are. And as we come as we are, he will not leave us as we are. And that's what we'll see in this story. Now we're seeing here that the man comes in light and in spite of his sin. And this is the beautiful thing about Jesus. This is what I promised you guys in welfare ministry. It says that Jesus knew that those who petitioned him for help had brought disease upon themselves. Yet he did not refuse to heal them. And when virtue from Christ entered into these four souls, they were convicted of what? Sin. And many were healed of their spiritual disease as well as of their what? Physical maladies, friends. Oh, how powerful and how lovely is Jesus Christ. How merciful. Sometimes we may find ourselves, friends, in places and in situations, predicaments that we ourselves have caused. And we wonder, will God help me despite the fact that I brought this upon myself? And what is the promise? What do we see here? Will Christ help us? Yes. He says, come regardless of whether we're in a trial because he allowed it to come to us. Or we're in a trial because we brought it upon ourselves. He says, still come and I'll help you. So friends, we have a savior that is willing to help us regardless of what the situation is. Now the Bible says to us there in verse 19. So it says... And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop of Peter and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. Now, this is so beautiful because as we're looking at this story, in order to get this man down through Peter's roof, there had to be a tearing up of Peter's roof. Does that make sense? right so they literally violated this guy's property and then they lowered the guy down before jesus but look at jesus look at jesus this is so amazing when jesus sees the guy being lowered before him verse 20 says and when he saw their violation no nah, when he saw their faith that's right what does that tell me that tells me friends that there are times that people are desperate to get to Christ. And in desperation, they will do desperate things. It is for us to be able at times to look beyond the action to the heart. Why is a person doing this? Because in our society today, many times we are tempted just to look at a situation for face value. But God is saying to us, we must look and see as God sees. If we have the spirit of God, then we will be able to see when a person is truly trying to get to him. And as a result, rather than wrath, there will be mercy. Because we understand. So it says here in verse 20, and when, they saw, when he saw their faith, he said to the man, man, Thy sins are forgiven. Now, that's the first process in salvation. The Bible calls this process being justified, forgiven of sin. So regardless of what this man had done, regardless of the fact that what he had done got him into this predicament, Christ says, I forgive you. And he absolves this man of all of the sins of his past. 
But the amazing thing about this story is that it doesn't stop here. Christ is not content to only forgive us of sin. He desires to change our lives. And so this is what I want us to look at a little bit as we go to verse 21. Because what happens many times is if he doesn't do a change, friends, many times people can't believe it. <laughs> In the next part of the story, as Jesus forgives this man's sins, the Pharisees and the doctors of the law, they actually say, who, is, who does this guy think he is? And sometimes when God forgives us of our sins, many people can't believe that Christ can do it. They don't believe that Christ could actually change you and I. I remember when I, um, as Pastor shared, um, as he was reading a little bit about my story, I remember in 2005, it was the end of uh, 10th grade summer. And I was in high school, public high school, Kennedy High School. And as I was there, um, I loved to do a whole bunch of, uh, you could say, crazy things. I had a clique, and all of us, we each learned a different martial art. And the way that you got into that friendship circle was you had to fight each other. And so we fought each other, and regardless of whether we lost or won, we were in. And so this was my go-to in every trial of life, in every situation that I faced, until the year 2005 came. I will never forget this year. I was at a football game at, at my high school. And of course, the high school that I was at, as it always happens, it lost in that football game. And so... My friends and I, it was myself and three, my best friend Alex, and two of my other friends. And right after we lost, we were like, man, let's go back to Melvin's house and let's chill, let's get some food. And so as we were going to go back, my mother called. And as she called, she said, son, you know what, I think I'm going to come and pick you up. And I said, man, I was just about to hang out with these guys. She was like, no, it's time to come home. And she got me. She came and she got me. And I was like, man. But the next day, I was so thankful that she took me home. That day, my three friends, they were going back to Melvin's place. And as they were going back to Melvin's place, three guys approached them. And the guy in the middle, he said to my best friend, he says, man, you have change for a 20? And my friend Alex was like, no, I do not. And so they went past them, but they decided, since it was getting late, to take a shortcut through a dark alley that they knew. And so the guy who asked for the 20 knew that dark alley like the back of his hand. He ran in, punched my friend Alex in his face. His glasses flew off, but he managed to keep running. My friend whose house they were going to, the guy gave him a few body shots to his back. And then he managed to get away. And our last friend, Peter, he took him and he threw him on top of a car, started punching him. He managed to get away with a few bruises, however. And so they got back to my friend Melvin's place, and my friend Alex asked this age-old question. Why do bad things happen to good people? So as he started inquiring about this, his uncle called, and he told his uncle the situation, and his uncle was an elder in one of our churches. And so his uncle began to explain to him this concept of the great controversy. The battle between good and evil. Hence, the evil in the world. And so as he began to study this, I will never forget this, friends. The very next week, let's say that was a, a, a Thursday. The very next week, my friends and I, not only were we absorbed in martial arts, we were absorbed in the hip-hop world. So my friends, we were wearing... Baggy pants like three times our size. We were wearing what was called, I don't know if you guys ever heard of it. It's called white tees. Do you guys know what white tees are? So, t-shirts all the way down to your knees, right? And so we were wearing that with Looney Tunes and all of these different cartoons on it. And uh, my friends, they were able to somehow acquire new clothing every single week. 
But when that situation happened to my friend Alex, the very next week, the guy was actually wearing clothes that fit him. And that really shocked me. I was like, what is wrong with this guy? This guy's crazy. But really, I was crazy, right? So he started acting very strange, but he was still kind to us. He was still tender to us. He still hung out with the group. But I began to ask him, man, why are you, why are you acting this way now? Why are you so serious about God and stuff like that? And he began to explain to me, he says, Akeem, I have become a seven-day Adventist Christian. And so I sat down with him after school and he began to explain to me all of these things about how he had changed and how the Bible was changing his life. And then one day, a prophecy meeting was happening in our area and I went with him to that meeting and it changed my entire life. And so now that was 10th grade summer. Now we're going into the 11th grade. So my life had completely flipped. I got back out to school and whereas I would be in the hallways fighting and playing jokes and giving my teachers problems, I went into my class five minutes before, opened my Bible and I started reading it. And I remember one of the guys who was a basketball player at the school, he came up to me in the class and usually what we would do is we would do what you call, you guys know what a dap is, right? So he would dap me up and usually we would say some very derogatory words to one another in the way that we greeted each other. And so he reached out and he greeted me that way. And so I greeted him back and I said, brother, how are you doing, man? And so he was dumbfounded. He looked at me in my face. He was like, brother. And then he looked down and he saw my Bible. He was like, oh, you a Bible boy now. And so I said, I guess so, man. And for the next few months, people were playing jokes on, my, on myself and my, on my best friend. But as we kept going, they realized what we were doing was not a phase. They began to realize that we were consistently seeking God and seeking to be an influence in our school. To the point that our teachers started letting us take over the class to give Bible studies. And so stuff like this was happening. And the reason I say this is because as I was making the point, it is not enough for God to forgive us of our sins. He wants to bring fruit out of our lives to show that we have changed. Hence, the story of the paralytic continues this way. It says in verse 21, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, that they couldn't believe it, he answered and said unto them, what are you thinking about in your hearts? What is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to rise up and walk. But that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. So what he was about to do was to show what? I can forgive sins, right? He said, I say unto you, arise, take up your couch and go into your own house. And what did that guy do? He got up, right? And he went his way glorifying God, the Bible tells us. So what does that tell me? Because there are times people say, well, Akeem, man, I prayed to God for healing and it didn't happen. I prayed and asked God to take away this thing from me and it wasn't taken away, this sickness or whatever it may be. But the major point of the story, while God can do healings today, the major point of the story is this. That when this man was healed, it was a symbol of a changed life. Amen. And so what God is showing is more than a physical healing, even though that will come, whether, whether it be now or at the second coming. He's trying to show us that he can change us. He can transform us. Now, the beauty of this is that Jesus in this story, he doesn't only forgive sins. He literally reverses its effects. So he takes away the paralysis and the man jumps up. So all of that stuff that he did that led him into that state of paralysis, gone. 
Can you imagine that? Friends, I tell you the truth. You may have done certain things in your life that you are ashamed of. Things that may have gotten you into situations even now that you hate. But I tell you the truth. God can reverse those things. If we put our trust in him. And that's the second part of the story. The second part of the story is revealing where this guy is healed. It's revealing the concept of sanctification. A changed life. The fruit of a forgiven life is a transformed life. So you got your Bibles with me. I want you to keep your fingers in Luke 5. And I want you to go with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 14. This is one of my favorite chapters in scripture. So hold your fingers there in Luke chapter 5. Now you remember this guy is healed. But we're going to do a connecting. We're going to connect some dots here. So Revelation chapter 14. And when you are there, go to verse 6. And say amen when you're there. All right. So it says there. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And this is what the angel says. Now remember, this angel is a symbol of us. It's a symbol of those who embrace the message that is going to be shared here. It says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. So let's stop there. This is what we call the first angel's message. Now notice the message that we give. Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. So what are the first two parts? Fear God and do what? Give glory to him. Say that again with me. Fear God and give glory to him. Now, as we give this message to the world, think about it. You go up to someone's door in a broken neighborhood. Somebody was talking about this function within families. Happening all over the United States and in different parts of the world itself. And you go to a person's door. You knock on that door and you're trying to reach them for Christ. And as they open the door, you tell them, fear God and give glory to him. And to add to that, because the hour of his judgment's here. Do you think the majority of the people that hear something like that will be susceptible to it? No. no. Now, can anybody tell me why? Why do you guys think? It won't make sense. Won't make sense? Anyone else? They don't know the word, right? Okay, all right. And they, don't, they may not even know God, right? So in the midst of brokenness, in the, break, in the midst of situations of addiction, of, of, of situations where families are breaking up, as we bring this message, it has to be given in the most practical way possible. And so what I was thinking was we have a powerful pioneer in our movement, um, actually just before our movement, his name, of course, you guys have heard his name before, William Miller. One of the things about William Miller history tells us is the reason that people were drawn to his messages is because he united prophecy with the Gospels. And so the prophecies became super practical as a result of uniting them. So that's what we're going to do right now. So remember, what is the message? Fear God and give him glory. So the question is, what will cause people that don't understand the gospel, that don't even know God, that are like, man, you're telling me about God, and man, my home's broken. I don't have food. I don't know where to go next. I have addictions that I'm working through. Why would they want to do that? What would cause a person to practically be willing to do that? Go back with me in your Bibles now to the book of Luke chapter 5. We're going back to our story. And I'm going to read verses 24 once again onward. So we're looking at what will cause a person to want to revere or respect God. 
and glorify God in their lives. So, Luke chapter 5, verse 24 onward, it says, But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say to you, arise, take up your couch, and go to your house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up the very thing that he was laying on and departed to his own house glorifying God. Now, I want you to notice the reaction of the people, all right? So it says here in verse 26, and they were all amazed, and look at what they did. And they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Did you see it? What caused them to fear God and give him glory? The manifestation of a changed life. They saw what a forgiven and changed life looks like. They saw what grace can do. And that caused them to be willing to fear God and give him glory. This is why I always say, friends, it is not the proclamation of the gospel that will bring about the end of the world. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, this very statement, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. Now, what's the difference between a witness and a testimony? Does anyone know? A testimony is what? Something that happened to you, right? And how do you communicate that thing that happened to you? You tell about it, right? So a testimony is basically you telling of your experience. Now, is that powerful? Yes. But is that what is going to end the world? No. Christ says what is needed is a witness. Now, what is a witness? Someone that, yeah, it's something that you could see, right? So God is saying, Christ is saying, it is when people see a manifestation of the gospel in our lives. That's when the second coming is going to happen in power and glory. Because God wants to show broken people what grace can do through lives that were broken. Amen. He takes people that were once in dysfunction. And he uses them to reach those who are in dysfunction. They have to be able to see the demonstration. Before they actually believe. So Christ says to the world. I will meet you right where you are. And I will give you that demonstration. Friends. My prayer for us today as we close, is that we will become that demonstration of love that the world is looking for. That people can know that Christ is alive. Why? Because of what he's done in your life and mine. They see a practical example. Now, I wanted to quote this statement to us. We'll skip this one. But the Bible actually brings out this point, And this is one of my favorite verses in scripture at this time. And this is what causes people to fear God, as you guys mentioned. So Psalm 130, verses 1 through 4, this is what it states. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for, for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. So this person is in a bad place. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O Lord, could ever survive? But you offer, what? Forgiveness that we might learn to... So what causes us to fear God? The, the fact that he's so forgiving. This is what will lead people to fear God in the entrance. It is not the fact that God is a God of wrath, even though God has wrath. But it is the fact that he is so good. This is what will cause people to be willing to respect someone like our father. Lastly, what we've covered here is known in scripture 
as salvation or justification by grace through faith. So we've basically covered the steps of salvation in the story of the paralytic. We saw forgiveness of sins. That is to be justified. We saw the transformation of life. That is sanctified. And we saw that the people gave God glory as a result of this man's changed life. That is glorified. The reason that this is so important is if we cannot get the first step in this process, it destroys every other opportunity that God wants to take. Now, what do I mean by that? There are times, friends, when we fail the Lord and we have a hard time believing that God could actually forgive us. We have a hard time moving on once we've asked for forgiveness. We say, God, I've asked for forgiveness, but I don't feel forgiven. But the crucial thing that the Bible teaches is that there is a huge difference between faith and feeling. You may not feel like you are forgiven, but it doesn't mean that you aren't forgiven. God has forgiven us, and once we believe that, God can then continue to do a work in our lives that we did not anticipate. Now, why do I say that? It is because of this crucial statement, and this is found in the Review and Herald, September 3rd, 1889. The enemy of man and God is not willing that this truth specifically to be justified. That is, to learn the science of forgiveness. The devil is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. Why? Because he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. If he can control minds so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. That's why God wants us to believe that when we ask for forgiveness, that when we ask for that transformation, he is working it out. He is doing it in our lives. My prayer for us today, friends, is that we would believe what the word says. The man who was paralyzed, he didn't question Jesus when Jesus asked him to get up and walk. He believed the word, set his will to obey the word, and the power of the word flooded his very soul. If your desire is that you would experience that same power that the paralytic experienced, then I ask you to stand with me as we pray. 